What is limiting the clock speed of a computer built from TTL chips? I think it's a stupid idea of using TTL chips for that in the first place. But since you and I love tinkering and learning by doing, we pass this warning sign without hesitation. I am going to show that the speed limit of a TTL computer is well above 8 MHz. Warning! Tuning TTL computers can be addictive. To make things clear, I'll be fighting here only against my own design choices, while using standard 74HC logic and early 2000s memory chips, namely the 62256S RAM and the 39SF Flash, both in their cheaper, slower version. I do hope that my lessons learned will be of general interest, but my specific guinea pig for testing will be this minimal CPU I've designed. It's only 39 TTL chips for the processing power of a Commodore 64. And we will more than double that today. A link to it is in the description. Inside a computer in its simple as possible form, as described by A.P. Malvino in his seminar textbook Digital Computer Electronics, a single system clock paces all components. The falling edge of the clock marks the start of a clock cycle, where the instruction step counter increments and the CPU control word updates accordingly. During the first part of the cycle, outputs of active components stabilize. The second part of the cycle begins with the rising edge of the clock, where subsequent reading actions happen. In order to drive the instruction step counter at the falling edge of the clock, an inverted clock signal is fed into the component's active high-going clock input. In blue you see Minimal's clock running nice and slowly at 1 MHz. In red we have the inverted clock. Let's have a look at bit 0 of the step counter. As you can see it's toggling at the start of a cycle. And that's a control signal, also updating at the start of a cycle. Now to make the CPU more powerful, we can just crank up the clock rate. But what is the critical path limiting us here? Well, that certainly is the longest streak of operations that must occur in sequence. For CPUs of that simple as possible or SAP type, it's the path where the step counter is reset at the end of an instruction. The step counter advances, the control word updates pulling the reset of the step counter, which immediately results in another or a second update of the control word. Compared to other paths, this sequence leaves us with the least time until the rising edge of the clock looms and all outputs need to be stable for reading. Let us do some simple math and measurements on the minimal that certainly has much in common with the SAP family. Here you see a list of the mentioned tasks. I have enumerated them with I and A to F. Let us trigger at the falling edge of the clock and take that as a starting point. We see the clock inversion and the counter increment taking about 10 nanoseconds each. The first control signal becomes valid at around 45 to 50 nanoseconds. 15 nanoseconds later the step counter resets. 90 to 95 nanoseconds in we see the second late update of the control signal. And another 20 nanoseconds later, or 65 nanoseconds after the first control signal here shown in blue, we finally get a stable output on the bus. Let us also allow for 10 nanoseconds of total jitter. This sums up to 125 nanoseconds in total. Multiply that with 2 for a minimum cycle time of 250 nanoseconds or a maximum clock rate of 4 MHz. Let's see how things play out on my actual hardware. Let me swap out the crystal with my Raspberry Pi Pico adjustable clock generator here. Within the Arduino IDE I've installed Earl Philhauer's package that exposes the Pico's C C++ SDK. I'm using this handy set sys clock kilohertz function to adjust the speed of the Pico. Then switch off all interrupts and toggle pin 1 inside this endless compensated while loop. To convert the Pico's 3.3V output to 5V, I feed pin 1 into a 74HCT245 buffer IC. Easy enough, works like a treat and costs only $4. As you can see, the minimal powers up at 1MHz. Let's try 3MHz right away. And we always need to adjust the UART speed to 1 16th of the clock rate accordingly.
And this also works. I spare you the tedious 0.1 MHz steps here. The highest clock rate at which the minimal runs reliably is 3.8 MHz, in good accordance with our estimate. End of the line, right? Boy, was I wrong. As I said, we'll be pushing this limit above 8 MHz before this video is over. In today's world of gigahertz clocks, that might not sound impressive, but for my little toy, it's huge. Running at 3.68 MHz, the minimal already has roughly the processing power of a Commodore 64. Imagine what becomes possible if we could more than double that speed. Ok, enough talking. What's the trick? Let's have a closer look at clock and its inversion. As we have seen, the signal is late by a gate propagation delay of about 10 nanoseconds, already stealing us valuable time. Our critical path barely fits into the first part of a cycle and does not leave much room for improvement, as I have denoted by just this single dot. At the falling edge of the clock we work on the tasks I, A and B, until we get a valid control signal. The critical path ends with F. Magic happens if we just swap the two clock wires. That means using the original clock to only drive the step counter and drive everything else with the late inverted clock. Now the step counter clock's rising edge happens 10 nanoseconds prior to the start of a cycle, buying us 20 nanoseconds extra time as compared to the situation before. Note that the task I for inverting the clock signal is no longer part of our critical path. We see more breathing space appear denoted by now three dots. This tiny change instantly yields 4.9 MHz maximum rate on our hardware. I think that's fantastic. But is this improvement in accordance with our understanding? Hmm, since we have pushed 20 nanoseconds, that is, task I and A, of our total 125 nanoseconds out of our equation, we only need 105 nanoseconds for a half cycle or 210 for a full cycle. Hmm, but that justifies a maximum rate of only 4.76 MHz. We must be missing something. Let's take a closer look at our clock signal. Ah, the buffer chip has introduced some asymmetry, but in a really helpful way. We have 106 nanoseconds for the first part and only 97 nanoseconds for the second. That's only 92%. Let's take that into account by recalculating the cycle time as 105 nanoseconds plus 105 nanoseconds times 0.92. That equals to 201.6 nanoseconds or 4.96 MHz maximum rate. Okay, now we are back on track. And even more importantly, that forward delay and clock asymmetry idea looks like an exciting path to further improvements. In fact, as a thought experiment, let's increase this forward delay until the control word appears right where it's needed, at the start of a clock cycle, that is, at the falling edge of the clock, but not earlier, since that would mess up the read cycle of the previous operation. Note that we have now pushed the first three positions I, A and B out and into the tail end of the previous cycle. <laughs> Feels a bit like cheating, but we are not, since the control info, that is the flex and the instruction register, had already been sampled at the rising edge of that previous cycle. And we still can squeeze some more by throwing this asymmetrical clock trick into the mix. The rising edge of the clock must happen after the output F has stabilized in the critical path, so that the subsequent read operation of step 0 plays out successfully. And clock's falling edge should be just prior to the change in control signals at the end of a cycle. So in principle we could live with something like this. Now buckle up, see all the dotted space? We can leave it out. We can have our clock end right after task F and repeat immediately. We effectively double use AB as second clock phase and still fulfill all of our requirements.
I don't know about you, but my head is spinning. Does this mean we really only need to count the time for the critical sequence A to F? That is 115 nanoseconds as the minimum cycle time? That would yield a clock limit of 8.6 MHz. Let's see what we achieve on real hardware. So how do we increase the forward delay and the clock asymmetry at the same time, preferably without adding much circuitry? Well, let's repeat what we already have done with our clock signal. Let's simply feed it back into the next buffer stage of the 74245IC and into the next stage and so on and so on. We have 8 stages and each will add 10 nanoseconds good forward delay and increase the desired asymmetry at the same time. And we can adjust things pretty easily. With a 5 stage delay the control signal now happens right after clock goes low. And the rising edge and high second phase is exactly in the target zone. That's the best we can do, let's crank it up. Ok, the CPU stalls at 8.4 MHz but runs reliably up to 8.3 MHz. That's close to but not right at the predicted limit. But anyway, we are talking nanoseconds timing on a breadboard here and I'm quite content with what we've achieved. Keep in mind we've added only a single IC with close to no changes to the existing design. We've just unlocked the potential that was there from the beginning. To be honest, I feel very much surprised how powerful this seemingly simple CPU has become. I certainly did not see this while designing the CPU two years ago. I think it's really only the minimalistic principle that pays off and unfolds its magic here. I'll integrate the forward delay chip into the clock section of the CPU and use an 8 MHz oscillator for a bit of a safety margin. And then we can play some Tetris high speed runs. It almost becomes unplayable at 8 MHz. But let's also try the min interpreter version of Tetris that ran very slowly before. That's looking a lot better now. You might be asking, is the Minimal now the fastest clocked standard TTL computer? To be honest, I don't know and I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information about it on the web. The original PDP-1120 that came with a TTL CPU ran at 1.25 MHz. Highly integrated home computers of the 80s, the Spectrum, C64 or BBC Micro all ran well under 4 MHz. Even ambitious modern TTL computer projects seem to run at lower clock rates than the minimal's 8.3 MHz. For example, the Gigatron runs at 6.25 MHz, Magic 1 runs at 4.09 MHz and James Sharman's Pipeline CPU at 4 MHz. Please write it in the comments what other TTL computers out there are running above 8 MHz. But it has to be a complete computer with RAM and stuff, a naked CPU doesn't count. It might also be tempting to try faster rated memory and or 74AHC advanced high speed CMOS parts instead of the minimal standard 74HC logic and slower rated memory chips. But who knows what other critical path might raise its ugly head and these high speed ICs are much harder to find and more expensive. That's really not my cup of tea, I'm more interested in exploring my own ideas in circuit design.
As always, I'll post my updated schematics on GitHub. The link is in the description. And a word of warning. You might have noticed that I've never referred to the datasheets of the parts I've used. Instead, I've measured on my desk how they actually perform at room temperature. I promise they are not handpicked, but chances are that due to manufacturing tolerances, you might or might not see slightly different clock rate limits on your end. Just be aware of that and experiment a bit. So thanks for sticking around and liking and subscribing to my channel. I always love reading your comments. I hope you got a thing out of all this. Take care. Bye.